once you run a job with good specs that you've written, you'll know your job better and, and you'll, you'll be able to get a better product for your client. Episode 105. This is The Business of Architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where each week I speak with a successful architect, designer, or consultant to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. When you speak to the folks over at BQE Software, please mention this show. Because when you use ArchiOffice, you support Business of Architecture, which allows me to continue bringing you this content. Today we are talking about best practices for residential construction drawings with architects Marilyn Modinger and Rand Selner. You'll learn about some of the common mistakes that we can make on construction documents. You'll also hear about Arch Spec, a pre-written specification system specifically made for residential architects that can save you time and protect you from costly errors on your drawings. You can find out more about Arch Spec at Arcomes. Dot org. That's arch, A-R-C-H-O-M-E-S dot org. Now, here's my interview with architects Marilyn Modinger and Rand Selner. What are some best practices, best practices for construction documents from your experience, Rand? Fine. Yep. <clears throat> uh, when in doubt, show it. <clears throat> uh, because if it's something that you don't understand as an architect... Think about the contractor out there trying to put it together. <clears throat> and if there's something that you haven't solved as an architect, you really need to. <clears throat> you need to think about it. You need to draw it. Uh, figure out how that uh, roof truss meets that adjacent framing and, and whatever. Now, <clears throat> if it's something that, that you can, uh, based on normal processes, like we don't, for instance, detail overbuilds. I'm talking about where you've got a sloping gable roof and you've got another gable roof intersecting it. You know, we'll just point at that and we'll say, use 2x12s at 16 inches on center and put some flat plates of 2x12s to frame into the existing uh, roof plane. We don't detail that because we believe that most builders, as Marilyn says, they're smart people. You know, they're out there dealing with this stuff every day. They know how to do that. <clears throat> so common things that are common practice, we don't really go into too much emphasis. But what we try to do is to at least one time show how to do things that maybe might be a little bit different than what they're used to doing. And we have a note that's in our drawings and in the specs that says, we haven't detailed everything. We haven't specified everything. However, there's enough information in the set so that you as a builder should be able to take similar ways in which we've shown it or specified it and be able to translate that to apply to similar conditions. Does that make sense, Enoch? Absolutely. Okay. Makes sense to me. Then again, I'm not a con. Well, actually, I'm a contractor, but my license is currently on hiatus. So, with that said, thank you, thank you, Rand, for that um, question. So, we we talked a little bit about best practices for drawings, and you know, I I remember it's I'm, my memory's being jogged now as you guys are talking. I mean, there's always the old lessons that I learned when I was starting out as an intern, right? So there was like always dimension to the same side of the wall. You know, always dimension. And if you're going down, you know, if you're doing a string of walls, make sure that the line intersects every single wall, that you're not trying to dimension some wall that it doesn't intersect over here because that's going to throw off your dimension string. You know, um, only show things once is another lesson that I learned, which was like, you know, if you show things twice in the drawing, you have the same dimension twice, there's liability there for potential to make an error because one of the dimensions is different. Uh, any other lessons like that, that that pop into your head before we move on? Either of you, Marilyn or, or Rand? putting you guys on the spot here. Uh, <clears throat> I think that, <clears throat> and this gets back to one of the reasons why uh, we created Arch Spec. I think it's easy for architects to start getting so involved with putting text notes on a drawing <clears throat> that the very act of doing that, it, when taken to its full extent can end up so cluttering a drawing with so many notes 
that you can't hardly see the graphics involved. And I think we've all been guilty of that. I think we've all seen that. I think Maryland's probably had to build from that. And so have you, Enoch. <clears throat> and so how do you get away from that? And so how do you describe things adequately and yet not clutter it up with a bunch of notes? So, and still fulfill your obligations as an architect. So what we came to and started doing over 30 years ago was a note system. And it started as a one, two, three, <clears throat> and then it started becoming, well, wait a minute. We, we know what the CSI main 16 sections are. Let's start making them a more intelligent note system. And so, you know, a division one was general things and uh, two is site work, et cetera. So <clears throat> we started grouping the notes like that in a, in a column on the right-hand side of the, the, the drawing. And <clears throat> that still does well for what we call organic notes. <clears throat> However, why would you want to create an organic note when you've already said it extremely thoroughly in the specifications? So we now have a combination when we do put notes on a drawing, we just stick it in a right-hand note column, and we pretty much just use the note number on the drawing, although sometimes we'll amplify that when there's room on the drawing to say something in common English like uh, PT 2 by 12 <clears throat> or uh, flashing. <clears throat> but not get too verbose where the field of the, the drawing is. And, and, but you can, you can overdo the note column too. So what we've also now done in our arch notes, which is an ancillary uh, element to the arch spec that comes with it in the same file, is we have organic plus uh, we have the specification of uh, paragraph numbers. We've numbered all the paragraph numbers in the arch spec and not all specs do that. <clears throat> and so, if you're looking at a specification, note that, that the number is 06100-185. Okay, you know automatically that it's in division six, so it probably has to do with wood or cabinetry or something, but 6100, a lot of people actually know that means rough framing. <clears throat> and so you, you can accept that in the note column where it says two by 12, or you can dig down deep in the contractor, go ahead and look in the specs, because it's in the set. And you can look, find division six, you know where that is, and you find that section number, 6100, then you look and you'll see, oh, there's that paragraph number. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a southern yellow pine number two with these extreme fine modulus and all the, all the other characteristics that are right there. <clears throat> but you don't have to put that on the drawing because you've already numbered that. So in a way, with arch spec, the, the actual specification becomes almost like a, a big note box <clears throat> like a kit of parts for what you really should be referencing right on the drawings and so how could you possibly misunderstand what that 2 by 12 is if you wanted to drill down and find that paragraph number and it also conversely limits the architect's liability because you've not been vague you've been extremely explicit but you've not overburdened the, the actual drawings does that all make sense yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had architect Frank Harmon on and he actually on his website, if you go to his website, he shares his construction documents. Do you have a sample set, Rand, that you can share with our listeners so they can go <coughs> in and look and see what you're talking about in terms of the notes, etc.? <coughs> well, actually, if you go on um, uh, the Arch website, once again, that's uh, archhomes.org, just one H, archhomes.org. <coughs> and if you look in the right-hand column on almost every page, look for the big, bold, gray note that says, by arch spec. <clears throat> and if you click on that button, you will see the arch spec page on the website. And if you scroll down, it's a really big page. There's a whole lot of information, probably more than you ever want to know. <clears throat> um, but if you scroll down, you'll start seeing example screen captures. So you can actually see examples of what I just said right there on that page. Excellent. Thanks, Rand. We'll definitely, we'll, we'll link to that in the show notes. So, which brings us up to Arch Spec. So, Marilyn, you had caught um, Rand's interview that he did with a few other people uh, previously on Mark LePage's podcast, and uh, you thought, you know what, that sounds interesting. And so you went ahead and tell me that story, and you, you ended up purchasing the Arch Spec system? I did, yeah. Um, so I actually... Um, I got it in my hands on a, on Friday, two weeks ago, and I had a permit <clears throat> a permit set due on Monday, and I thought, 
you know, I knew I was going to be working on through the weekend to get it done. And, you know, that's fine. Um, and I thought, well, you know, it's a small, it's a small renovation project. And, you know, I probably, I wasn't planning on doing specs for it because as I, you know, had said earlier, I think that I, um, don't have a spec written for myself yet. So I thought, well, you know, if I get this on Friday, at least I can take a look at it and see. And I started to work with it and uh, I didn't even start to work with it really till Sunday. So, so the truth is um, that within about six to eight hours, I actually had the spec written for this project. So I just, I want to be clear though, that it's, it's a, it is a small renovation <laughs> and it's an interior renovation. So I didn't have to worry about any exterior you know, sort of detailing of any kind. Um, so that certainly helped things move along pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, I was pretty surprised that I could use it that quickly. Um, and uh, so I think Rand sent me an email or we were back and forth a little bit. You know, he was just like, well, you know, did you get the codes to download it? And I said, yes, I did. And I've already used it and it's already out in a permit set. <laughs> so, <coughs> I, was, I was amazed to hear that, that she was able to implement it <laughs> so quickly that's just incredible yeah so and I you know there were certain things and I, I even said to Rand I was like you know I'd love to talk with you more about some of the things um, that I have questions on and, and how to make it work even better for me um, and it's gonna take a little bit it would it would have definitely taken longer had the project been you know included a lot of exterior details or, or been a big project it's only you know it's a, it's a small project but um, I think one of the things that it helped me do in the production phase was it, it helped it was sort of like a checks and balances. I could check back against the drawings and say, oh yeah, did I draw that? <laughs> now that's um, something I'm glad that you just said. And <laughs> Enoch, going back to best practices, <clears throat> that's something that specifications for every architect in the world. If you do specs, what Marilyn just said, it acts as a quality control checklist. <clears throat> so when you're going through and you're saying things like, oh, uh, I said on the drawings that I'm assuming a 2000 PSF, but you actually know, we actually had a geotechnical consultant on this project and he actually said it's 4,000 pounds per square foot bearing capacity based on the borings he took. So, oh, well, I better update that and say, hey, refer to the specs, the geotech uh, uh, report. And in fact, what we now do is we actually put in our spec, we recommend that you actually put uh, a project page on your, your company website for such things as a geotech report, the survey, and other important documents like an approved septic permit, and then you have those be downloadable by the GC uh, from your website. So we actually put links like that now in the art spec, and we encourage other architects that buy it to do the same. So what was the process, Marilyn, thank you for that, Rand, what was the process, Marilyn, to take those specs as they were in their raw form and then work them into your workflow? Um, so I, uh, it's in AutoCAD, so it was pretty, you know, I just opened up the file in AutoCAD, so it was pretty, um, I could get in there and drive around right away. Um, and I just went through, I read, I sort of skimmed through them to get a sense of like, uh, you know, sort of what they had in general. Um, and then I went through and I just started making it my own. So. Um, a lot of the notes referred to things that um, don't affect me here in Boston. Um, and so I took those out. Um, and some things were uh, I needed to add in because of being in Boston or because of uh, the nature of the project. So um, so I just I started um, literally just I did a save as and I just started moving text over um, and de deleting things that I that I didn't need and modifying things I did need. So it was pretty fast. I mean, um, it, it also, so also there's, you know, like 14 pages worth of specs in there or something. Um, I ended up with about a page and a half on this project. So that, that gives you the sense of the size of the project. Um, one, one thing that was helpful too was all the general conditions notes. Um, one thing that's in there that's pretty helpful is a bid form. Um, I ended up taking it out because I had my own bid form. Um, but I could imagine that if you didn't have a bid form, um, that would be pretty helpful. So, I ended up taking some of that out, but the general condition section, you know, that's a lot of stuff that we um, sort of take for granted or we forget to talk about or um, just how we want the job to be run. Um, and, you know, that's, that's important stuff. And I was thinking back to my contracting days and being like, okay, 
when I read through specs and I would see, I would get a sense of what kind of architect this is, what kind of, um, like what kind of priorities does this architect have? What kind of priorities does this client have? Um, and actually the general conditions section should reflect that and is, and is, um, unique to each pro. I mean, some things aren't unique, but, but, um, a lot of those things are unique to each project, um, and set the tone for the project. So yeah, I just started copying and pasting and that was pretty much what I did. So, uh, I had to do some research on my own to get like certain products or certain things that weren't included, um, in the spec and that's fine. I mean, that's what you would do with any other spec. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was pretty, pretty straightforward. Could you explain to me what you mean when you say the contractor, um, forgot how you worded it. You said, uh, they, they might approach things differently and you might modify your general conditions based upon. Oh yeah. That. So <clears throat> that might be something like, uh, for instance, this particular project is for a client who will be, um, living in the house while it's being renovated. <laughs> so that's a pretty major thing to have to be, to have to think about. So, you know, things like no smoking on the job site or cleaning up every day or dust control become, they're important on, on every job. And they are really important if the client is living on floor two and we're renovating floor three. So, um, so, so, so I would say that was the biggest one in this, um, in this particular one. Um, but so you know, if if you're working on a ground up construction that the client isn't living in, um, you have to worry about that stuff in a different kind of in a different way. So, so Marilyn, as as a recent purchaser of ArtSpec, you've had the opportunity to dive in there. Can you tell our listeners who are these for? Who would get the most value out of these particular specifications? Um, I think people who are. Uh, like myself, who are getting started, you know, so I've been in business for a year. Um, and uh, I, I think a lot of people think that they could sort of get away without specs. And that's not, that's not a good idea. Um, I'm doing a pretty complicated job right now without any specs. And I, it's not something I care to repeat. It was, wasn't something I really wanted to do in the first place. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't care to repeat that. Um, I would also, I think it's good for folks who are, who are establishing their practices, um, or, and, or who've never used specs before. Um, once you run a job with good specs that you've written, um, you'll know your job better and, and you'll, you'll be able to, um, get a better product for your client. Um, I would also say that it's, it's for someone that has experience. Um, I don't, and I, I think that that's reflected in the fact that if, you're running your own firm, supposedly you would have experience, you would be licensed and registered and all that good stuff. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's the kind of thing where if, if I would have given the specs to, you know, an intern or something, like, I might have had them take a pass at it and say, like, give me your best shot, but I would not then take those and put them directly into my drawing. Um, so it requires understanding, um, it requires the knowledge of, of a practitioner who's been at it for a little while. Um, and so would any, so would any spec. So I don't, I don't think that's anything to hold it back, but, um, I think it's important to say that you can't, you can't just take this or any spec and just plug it in and be like, all right, here we go. Um, so it does require reading through every single word. Um, and that requires experience knowing how it kind of all fits together. Uh, but like I said, hopefully if you're running your own practice, you, um, have some experience already. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Rand, what can you add to that? What what can architects, what are they going to find inside of Arch? Spec? <clears throat> uh, you're going to find uh, it's 14 to 15 sheets right now. And uh, let's clarify it. That means 24 by 36 inch sheet. <clears throat> it's in 10 point aerial font. And there are very large, big, bold headers for each division. It's organized <clears throat> in the traditional CSI division, uh, which most architects probably could recite if they've been uh, around for a while, uh, you know, division one through 16. <clears throat> and we also added a division zero for bid forms and scope, and also a division 17 for low voltage systems. But <clears throat> a lot of, uh, some people might immediately criticize and say, hey, well, CSI changed about 10 years ago. Now we got about 50 sections. Why don't you do that? <clears throat> okay. 
Uh, since both of you are contractors or have a construction background, why don't you tell me why I shouldn't do that? It's residential architecture. It's okay, not that complicated. And, and will all your subs know all those 50 sections? Not in the residential side. In the commercial side, they would, but not residential. There you go. And it would just serve to confuse them. <clears throat> and so that's why ArcSpec is organized in the traditional, historic, CSI section. <clears throat> and so uh, most architects know that. And if all contractors don't know that, I'll bet each of the subcontractors certainly knows what their section is. And so that's why we did that. <clears throat> um, and if you start looking at the CSI sections, yeah, they, they did some elaborate things in Division 9 for different finishes and also in <clears throat> Division 13 for very special things. But you know what? They actually kept a lot of the main sections that historically have been known. Not all, but, but a lot. So there's, there's historic precedent for an understanding and a familiarity. So that's something you're going to find in our spec. Now, a lot of people automatically they have this knee-jerk reaction. Oh, I don't want my specs to be 14 or 15 pages. Well, okay, do what Marilyn did. Edit it down to be appropriate to your project. I mean, for, for crying out loud, we've got a swimming pool, a full boat swimming pool in Division 13 <clears throat> because uh, we had one of those and we put it in there. And so you're going to be yanking out quite a few things. Um, we did a kitchen renovation too uh, recently and uh, it ended up having about four and a half sheets. It was a really involved uh, job, but there was no exterior work. And it, it became distilled down to about four and a half sheets. Uh, <clears throat> now, other people also, uh, when they get it, they're going to say things like, well, hey, I specify wood low-end windows or Marvin windows. Well, that's not in there. <clears throat> um, what, what's, what's in there is what we call a mid-level to lower mid-level value engineered approach in terms of what manufacturers and what kind of systems are in there. So it's, it's vinyl windows. <clears throat> and the reason that's in there is because um, <clears throat> we've had practitioners in Arch that have gotten kicked in the teeth over decades because architects quite often get accused of gold plating a project. <clears throat> and that's something that Arch is trying to dispel and say, no, that's not true anymore. <clears throat> um, we actually understand what value engineering is, and we've learned so many things from contractors. Like they'll, the first thing they'll do if you have a, uh, and, and, and everybody's project comes in more than the client wants it to be. I mean, when's the last time you guys got surprised with lower than what you expected, huh? You know, so <clears throat> um, we, we would prefer to build into the spec a value engineered approach. So we have half a chance to help those architects that buy it to produce a project that hopefully is more valued engineered. And so the contractors that bid on it won't tell the client behind the architect's back, hey, you know, your architect really gold plated this thing because he has all these expensive windows. How'd you like to save $60,000? Just go with your vinyl windows. And most clients will go, oh, okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you want to have an option <clears throat> to do nicer windows, okay, fine. Put that option in to the owner optional upgrade in the bid form. And we do that. that. That's called an alternative uh, add option with, in commercial projects. Here we call it an owner optional upgrade. So, so what we're trying to do, the approach we try to do is have a value engineered approach to the specs. So could we add a whole bunch of sections to provide all those higher end systems? Certainly. But then there would be the, the blowback from that would be architects saying, well, hey, now it's 45 sheets. So <clears throat> we thought, the most reasonable approach <clears throat> is to have that median to slightly lower than median value engineer approach for what systems are in there. <clears throat> now, if you want to add your own window section in there, you go right ahead. <clears throat> um, but there's a lot of good stuff in there that's just uh, that you, you're probably not going to change, like the the uh, the energy section. I mean, that's really well done. <clears throat> I mean, you you have to adjust it to your climate zone. So if you're not in a 3A zone or a 4A zone, like it presently shows, you slide this little bar and move it to the type of humid condition, the A, B, or C, and then you move it into the uh, climate zone that you're in. And then it refers you to the actual page number in the IECC of, of where to find those those ratings. So the 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 boost that it gives an architect in being able to do the research on the spec is, is huge. 
because I mean, you have, you're, you're going to actually know what the page numbers are when you have to change things. So <clears throat> when you get these original 14 sheets, you go through, you get familiar with it, and you start pulling down. There's these guidelines, these big blue guidelines, which run, uh, if, if people are familiar with AutoCAD, what, what is it, DEF, DEF points? <clears throat> yeah, and so they're not going to print, <clears throat> but those are guidelines, so you can keep nice straight rows, <clears throat> and you use ortho on, on your computer, and, and you move those sections down. I, I strongly recommend, like Marilyn said, when you get it, you do save as, so you don't destroy the original art spec, <clears throat> because you may want to come back to that. Um, and then you you when you start working, you, you slide down the sections you don't use. There's a whole bunch of space down below it. And you pull those down or you copy and paste and then you reword that and put in the systems that you do want. But like I said, there, it comes with a lot of good boilerplate. Um, the intention is that you go through it once entirely reading every word and making the green text be green for your boilerplate because we use an index color that won't print green. It'll print black when you print it in, a, in, a, in your output on a plotter or if you make it into a PDF and send to your clients, it'll print out black. <clears throat> but the idea is that the green color coded text is boilerplate that once you do make sure that it's conforms to your practice, that you very rarely, unless you're doing something very unusual for the next project, you can keep that boilerplate on hopefully on autopilot. And then what's in red, particularly those that are encircled with a red uh, rectangle, those are the things that you mainly need to change. And you might have a sheet in which 90% or more is green, uh, and assuming you've already done your initial edit and made sure that it conforms to your practice, once you go back into it, you only need to edit about five or ten percent. So it's it's an intelligently organized uh, and keyed system. So once you make it yours, like Marilyn said, and like Don Duffy said on the Mark Lepay show, once you've made it yours, the next time you go back through it, it should be even faster. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about providing better value to the clients because they're getting a better set of drawings and there's going to be less confusion. It's going to help the contractor. It's going to help the architect. So thank you, Marilyn and Rand, for joining us today. Did you have any any last thoughts before we sign off on this episode? Um, <clears throat> you're going to have quite a few architects that are listening to this make the following statement. Oh, it's just a house that I'm designing here. It doesn't need specs. Uh, I think the architects that say that really need to look at themselves in the mirror uh, unless they think they're bulletproof and uh, uh, it, it, something's going to come back and bite them. And it's not just for them. It's, it's they're rendering a service to their clients to produce architecture. This is not just a, a spec house that, that a builder is building for a client. They expect when an architect designs something that they're getting, believe it or not, you ever hear the phrase plans and specs? And I think that every client that hires every architect in the United States believes they're getting plans and specs. I think they'd probably be horrified to know that that's not always the case. <laughs> Well, and I just add that I'm sure our architects on the line who are listening, you know, if this is for you, you probably know it. You've probably listened to this episode like Marilyn did to the last one and probably thought in your mind, you know what, that's something useful that I could use that could help me out. So we will put the information about how you can get these, the arc spec in the show notes. So if you go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash 105, because this is episode 105, you'll find the show notes to that. Marilyn, any last thoughts from you? Thanks for joining us. Sure. Um, well, it's been really fun today. Um, I just wanted to throw out, this was a little something I was thinking about a little bit earlier, and it, it relates to this idea of, of um, making the specs your own um, and however you decide to start with that. Like, I decided to um, use ArcSpec as a way to, to get started, but um, I'm also experimenting. Um, I teach at the Boston Architectural College. I teach construction detailing and a bunch of other things. And one of the things that we're experimenting with is better ways of communicating construction details and, and drawings. Um, and one of the things that we're working on is, um, and I have about six semesters worth of student research on this, is um, showing details and drawing in three dimensions. So what, um, you know, how could, and now my mind is turning, thinking how could those three-dimensional details um, 
be something that, uh, the, you know, the things that get repeated on every project, how to properly flash a window, how to, you know, these, these types of things. So as I'm going through this spec um, the next time around, not the day before I'm putting out a permit set, um, I'd like to be <laughs> keying in, uh, I'd like to make it as graphic as possible. Um, that's something that I've been thinking about too. Um, 3D details and 3D, even little vignettes, um, are easier to understand um, than two-dimensional drawings sometimes. Um, and they, even if you can, we've been experimenting with exploded drawings or just process drawings showing how things go together. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm eager to um, continue the conversation in the classes that I teach um, and hopefully have um, some of that research get um, fed back into some of this stuff. So, um, yeah, but I, I think three-dimensional details are also a great way. And integrating those into specs, I think, are uh, really key <coughs> as well. I think some of what you would you be willing to sh can you send me some of the most compelling images you have of those so listeners can go to the show notes to the page and be inspired by some of those three D images and what you're talking about. Sure, um, the student work. I just I have to make sure I, I have to ask their permission, but I think I think they'd be cool with me showing sharing their work. <laughs> okay, um, well, but sure. Enoch, you know, if I could add one last thing, go ahead, Rand. Uh, I think what Marilyn's referring to is that in our spec. There's actually quite a few two-dimensional little thumbnail AutoCAD details right in the spec. And, and what she's referring to is possibly making those in three dimensions, which I think would be a great idea, too. Um, and it, it's like explaining valley flashing. And you, you don't, if you want to, you can go ahead and detail that out on another master detail sheet. If you really want to, go ahead. But, you know, it's right there in the spec with the paragraph talking about it. And it really helps communicate, I think, well. And, and I think Marilyn's idea of making them three-dimensional is even better. Excellent. Well, I look forward to seeing ArchCH grow. As you know, I'm a member and support you fully. And as well, you know, look forward to seeing how ArchSpec continues to grow. So, Rand and Marilyn, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Anna. We'll see you later. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. If you enjoyed today's show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. There are two reasons to do this. First, it encourages me to continue making free content for you to run a fulfilling and profitable practice. And secondly, it allows others to find this content inside of iTunes so that they can benefit as well. For free resources for running an architecture practice that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the join button to unlock your account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, boost profitability, start a firm, and much more. Until next week, this has been the Business of Architecture. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.